Today we have quite an extraordinary looking double integral. It's the double integral from 0 to 1 and 0 to infinity of x by y divided by the square root of the cinch of x by y. So the first thing to notice here is that we have structures involving x by y. So we could make a nice transformation to begin with. But first up, we need to call the integral i for reference purposes. And the transformation I'm talking about is letting x by y equal to u. Now notice that we're first integrating with respect to x, so we hold the y variable constant. This implies that if we write x as y times u, this implies that the differential element dx is y times du. And the limits of integration are clearly not bothered for the first integral. That means we can write i as the integral from 0 to 1, integral from 0 to infinity. x by y turns into u. The differential element dx turns into y times du. And we're dividing it by the square root of the cinch of u. And we have this outer integration with respect to y. And this transformation was pretty useful because now we have an integrand involving functions of purely u times functions of purely y. So in this case, we can write the double integral as the product of integrals with respect to y and with respect to u. So we have one integral from 0 to 1 of y with respect to y, and then we have an integral from 0 to infinity, u divided by the square root of the cinch of u with respect to u. And of course, the integration with respect to y is pretty trivial. You'll get a y squared by 2 evaluated at the limits 0 and 1, which gives us 1 half. So this implies that i equals 1 half the integral from 0 to infinity of u du divided by the square root of the cinch of u. And I'm just going to call this integral here i sub 1 for now. And how exactly do we approach this? Well, a reasonable line of approach would be first up to, well, an obvious line of approach would be to expand the cinch function. We know that this equals e to the u minus e to the negative u divided by 2. So this implies that i sub 1 equals root 2 times the integral from 0 to infinity u du divided by the square root of e to the u minus e to the negative u. Next up, let's make a transformation. So we're going to take this e to the negative u and let it equal to a new variable, call it t, which implies that u equals negative log t. So this further implies that du equals negative 1 by t dt. And what about the limits of integration? Well, as u approaches 0, we have t approaching e to the 0, which is 1. And for u approaching infinity, we have the exponential term going to 0 because it's e to the negative u. So this implies that in the t world, i sub 1 is root 2 times the integral now from 1 to 0 of u, which is negative log t divided by the square root of e to the u. So e to the u would be the reciprocal of t minus t, and the differential element is negative 1 by t dt. So we have these two negative signs cancelling out, but we're integrating from 1 to 0, which looks kind of weird. So let's just switch up the limits of integration and introduce an extra negative sign. So we have negative root 2 integral from 0 to 1 log t divided by t times, let's Simplify this a bit, so we'll have 1 minus t squared, the square root of that, divided by the square root of t. And t divided by its own square root will, of course, sort out to the square root of t, integration with respect to t. Okay, so far so good. And let's make one more substitution here. And what should be the name of the new variable? Let's just rename it back to x because it's a dummy variable anyway, so it doesn't matter. Let's just rename it back to x. The transformation is going to be t squared being equal to x, which implies that t equals x to the 1 half, which further implies that dt equals 1 half of x to the negative 1 half dx. Okay, so this implies that i sub 1 equals the integral still from 0 to 1 because the limits of integration are clearly not bothered. 
we have log t, which becomes log x to the one half, or that is to say one half the log of x. So let's just pop that one half factor outside. Then we have a square root t in the denominator. So that turns into x to the one fourth. We have the square root of one minus x. And the differential element is one half times x to the negative one half dx. Okay, cool. So we have another factor of one half outside, so we can write this as root two by four, and then rule from zero to one, log x, and if we have x to the negative one fourth times x to the negative one half, we'll get negative one fourth minus negative one half, that's negative three quarters. Okay, cool. We're dividing this by, or let's just write it Oh, terribly sorry about that. Let's just write this. I'm going to take the logarithm to the side of it. Yeah, right there. And I'm going to make room for this term here that I'm writing as 1 minus x to the negative 1 half. Why so? That will become clear in a few moments. So we have this weird looking integral. And how exactly are we going to evaluate this? Well, we'll evaluate it the Feynman way. We're going to use Feynman's trick of taking an integral function, differentiating under the integral sign using the Leibniz rule, and then getting something that we can use to evaluate the integral i sub 1, possibly the exact structure we need for i sub 1. And in this case, the integral function is a very special function. It's the beta function with complex arguments u and v. This here is defined as the integral from 0 to 1, of x to the u minus 1 times 1 minus x to the v minus 1 integration with respect to x. And I've used the beta function quite a lot on my channel, but I don't think I've ever used this form of it. Maybe in a proof video. But yeah, I haven't used this form very often. It's normally the second integral form that I use. Anyway, so how exactly do we go from the beta function to the target integral? Well, that's easy. We just need a log x term, right? And if we differentiate partially with respect to u, this x to the u minus 1 term, then we get the repeated function x to the u minus 1 times the logarithm of the constant base x constant in the u world, that is. So that's the plan. We differentiate partially with respect to u. And we know that the integral defining the beta function is convergent, so we can switch up the order of the integration and the differentiation operators. So by differentiation, partially with respect to u, we have the integral from 0 to 1. Of x to the u minus 1 repeated, then we have 1 minus x times, uh, 1 minus x to the v minus 1 times the logarithm of x dx. Okay, so what we need now is u minus 1 be equal to negative 3 quarters, which implies that u would be a quarter. And we also need v minus 1 to be negative 1 half, which implies that v should be 1 half. So all of this means that the target integral i sub 1 is the partial... Wait, wait, we still had a couple of terms outside. Yeah, we had this root 2 by 4, and I'm forgetting something else. I'm pretty sure I am. Yeah, there was this negative sign here that I've remembered after quite a long while. Somebody has probably pointed this out in the comments already. Anyway, so we have a negative root 2 by 4 times, an, uh, times the integral we need, which is the partial derivative of the beta function with respect to u, evaluated at u being equal to a quarter and v being equal to 1 half. Okay, so we know that we have to differentiate the beta function with respect to the parameter u. But how do we move forward from here? Well, that's easy. All we have to do is call on the beta function's cousin, the gamma function. So we have beta uv equal to gamma u times gamma v divided by gamma u plus v. And on differentiation partially with respect to u, we have this gamma v term outside, and by the quotient rule, we'll have a gamma u plus v times gamma prime u minus gamma prime u plus v times gamma u, all divided by the square of the gamma function evaluated at u plus v. 
Okay, so we know that u is supposed to be a quarter and v is supposed to be one half. So on the right hand side, we have gamma one half outside, which is root pi times gamma three quarters times gamma prime at a quarter minus gamma prime three quarters times gamma quarter. All of this is supposed to be divided by the square of the gamma function evaluated at three quarters. And the numerator here looks like quite a mess, but thankfully there's a really nice way to clean this up using a very cool function, the digamma function. So we have digamma z defined as gamma prime z divided by gamma z. And this implies that gamma prime z equals digamma z times gamma z. So that means if we have gamma prime at a quarter, then this equals digamma one by four times gamma one by four. And similarly, if you have gamma prime at three quarters, then this equals digamma three quarters times gamma three quarters. So bearing in mind these structures, it means we can factor out quite a bit of stuff from the numerator. So this implies that the partial derivative of the beta function with respect to u equals root pi times what exactly can we factor out? Well, we have gamma one by four as well as gamma three by four. And we're dividing everything by this squared gamma function at three by four. And what's left behind is because of the derivative at one by four, the digamma function evaluated at one by four minus the, the digamma function evaluated at three by four. Okay, so immediately we see some cancellation here. So we have root pi times gamma one by four divided by gamma three by four, which I will simplify later. But first I have to deal with this difference of digamma functions at one by four and three by four. There's a nice sort of difference formula for the gamma function, the digamma function that is, that can be derived using Euler's wonderful reflection formula. We have gamma z times gamma one minus z equal to pi times the cosecant of pi times z. So if you take logarithms and you differentiate with respect to z, then what you get is digamma one minus z minus digamma z equal to pi times the cotangent of pi z. So if we let z equal to a quarter, we'll have digamma three by four minus digamma one by four equal to pi times the cotangent of pi by four, which we all know to be one. And just switching up the signs, so we have exactly what we need. That means we have negative pi. Okay, cool, so this implies that the derivative with respect to u, evaluated at those values of u and v, of course, equals root pi times negative pi times gamma one by four divided by gamma three by four. And of course we can simplify this further, again using the reflection formula with z equal to a quarter. So in that case, we have gamma one by four times gamma three quarters equal to pi times the cosecant of pi by four, which we know is root two. So this implies the gamma three quarters equals pi times root two divided by gamma one by four. So plugging this result into this equation we have, this implies that the partial derivative of the beta function with respect to u at those values of u and v equals negative pi times root pi times now the square of the gamma function at one by four divided by pi times root two. So again, we have some nice cancellation. And recall that the target integral i sub one was negative root two by four times this result. So we have the negative signs canceling out and we have root two by four times root pi by root two times gamma squared one by four. And again, some nice cancellation here. And recall once more, that the OG target integral was one half of I sub one. So we have this result that I equals one half 
of root pi by 4 times gamma squared 1 by 4, which itself is a, is a really cool way to write the final result. But there's another way involving a really neat constant. So what I'm going to do to introduce that constant is expand root pi. I can expand it as pi divided by root pi, correct? And we have this gamma squared 1 by 4 term. And what I need is this root pi to turn into root 2 pi, as in I need a root 2 here as well. And root 2 by 2 can, of course, be written as the reciprocal of root 2. Okay, cool. And what do we have here now? I just need another factor of 2 that I can borrow from this one quarter. And now all of this, no wait, uh, scratch the pi. Let me just get rid of the pi. And I'll just write this as 1 by all of that. And I'll write the pi over here. So all of this that I've boxed in is what's called the Lemniscate constant omega bar. So this implies that the target integral i has a very, very beautiful final result expressed in terms of two important constants. We have pi times the Lemniscate constant divided by 2 times root 2, which is a really elegant solution indeed. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.